Assalamualaikum everyone. Um, we're about to go on a live. I'm just waiting for Brother Noor to join me. We're going to be talking about um, preteens, looking at um, how we manage technology, looking at helping them build character in truthfulness, um, helping them to transition through getting into you know, adolescence and the changes that we'll experience. I thought it would be really good to bring in somebody who's an expert in that field. Um, I will just give you a bit of background as to why I've invited him in today. I'm just going to wait for him to come on and send him um, a little reminder, inshallah. I thought I'd jump on first. Um, we might have to come on in a little bit because I think we were scheduled for 10 o'clock. So the background to doing this, um, I myself have an 11 year old about to go to high school um, and I'm just going to invite uh, Brother Noor in, just give me a moment so that inshallah then he can join us. Um, if anybody has any questions, Asalaamu As Alaikum. Wa Alaikum Asalaam Allah. How are you? Alhamdulillah, not too bad yourself. I'm okay, alhamdulillah. Thank you. I know um, I've been excited for today. I had clients all day, so I've not been in touch. And I know that I, I got in touch with you just a little bit a while ago. But I am excited um, to be talking to you. I was just telling the, you know, the people that have joined us today a, a little bit of background as to why I reached out to you. Um, mm -hmm. I follow your stuff on Instagram, and I'll get you to tell our audience a little bit about who you are. Yeah. Um, and what you do as well so that would help um, but for me is I myself have an 11 year old a nine year old and I have a lot of clients at the moment who are coming to me with challenges um, with technology with the character building with the transition from going from you know pre-teens to teenage years and the child maturing into adulthood and how that you know how the parents manage that so I thought it'd be great to speak to another professional and get some insights, you know, into what yeah. we can do as Muslim parents. So before we begin, I'd like you to kind of, if you could introduce yourself and let us know a little bit about you, and then we'll get started, inshallah. Okay. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, rasulullah, wa alayhi wa sahbihi wa nawala. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Myself, um, obviously my name, Noor Chowdhury. Um, in terms of uh, me as a parent, um, I'm a father of six. Um, my eldest is in is a teenager and the youngest is a toddler so i have a varying age spectrum uh, four boys and two girls um and um, uh, profession wise uh, i'm a parenting consultant um i'm a founder of um involved fathers um which um while he has a broad category and he can support many parents and um, this is more specific for muslim parents and even more specific um, um, to kind of support Muslim fathers uh, to become more nurturing and more involved in their children's lives. Um, so trying to kind of work with fathers more so, although the, the kind of provisions are open to both mothers and fathers. Um, and so I've been doing this um, for the last uh, three three years. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, prior to that, I completed um, studies in um, Diploma in Child Psychology and Certificates within um, counseling and life coaching um, and um, it's this kind of I kind of came more into this um, previously before that my years were in kind of within kind of uh, humanitarian work and aid um, and uh, kind of youth and community work um, kind of as a founder and the trustee of a charity called uh, Human Aid um, which I'm currently the chair of again um, after taking a break um, and also um, had worked many years within senior management within kind of the youth and community sector. So most of my work has been around um, kind of community and given to others as opposed in, in, the, in, the, in the private sector, um, kind of um, in the third sector, not the uh, mm -hmm. private or public sector. Um, and this kind of started instead of a few years ago because I took a break from where I was within kind of senior management and uh, strategic management roles um, because I was diagnosed with cancer back in 2016. Um, and uh, after that, I uh, also went through surgery, chemotherapy. You know, alhamdulillah, you know, I'm just coming up to you know later on next week should be my three years in remission. So, alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah. you know, um, uh, I've been well. And since that point, I took a break and was able to kind of realign in terms of what was kind of needed and what I kind of wanted to really do. 
And so then I con continued studies, finished studies, and then basically this is where I am at the moment. So alhamdulillah, that's a brief intro into myself in terms of what I've been doing and why I'm doing this really. Gosh, it's a... Um inspiring journey thank you for sharing that with us i had a, a curiosity why you chose to work with particularly muslim fathers could you give me a bit of insight or us into some insight into why specifically fathers for you there must be something yeah of a connection yeah so um a lot of the time what actually even brought me onto this kind of journey and the work that i'm currently doing is that i i was out there looking for um uh things in and around parenting obviously having six children there's a lot of things um, to be done and I've always been from the moment they were born um, my take on parenting um, was very much hands-on being involved um, and maybe completely different to how I was parented maybe from my father and and so and that previous generation and so I've had ideals and ideas from 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 a younger age that was kind of um, that grew inside me and that's what kind of um, pushed me towards it so as I was kind of journeying and looking and reading and studying one of the things that kind of stood out for me a lot was that there isn't much provisions or there aren't much provisions out there for Muslim parents um, uh, specifically Muslim parents meaning there are or written from an Islamic perspective um, what, what I did find out there was anything that was written from a kind of Muslim or Islam perspective, they're very much on a theory basis, nothing very much practical. Mm. And a lot of the works that I found very beneficial was actually those who were done by non-Muslims. Some of them, actually, a lot of them were actually religious or practicing Christians, um, and kind of learning from them. And so that I actually found, I took more benefit from that. And so through my studies and one of the things I realized there was, there's kind of a, a kind of a gap, there's something missing. More so, um, there wasn't nothing coming really for fathers and with the kind of work that I've been doing and even my own personal experiences with my own children, it became clear that, you know, that there, you know, I think a lot of the times, you know, we tend to parent the way we were parented and that cycle continues. And so the only time you can break that cycle is when you make a conscious choice and a conscious decision that actually, no, I need to pause, reflect and then change. And then can things actually change and you break that cycle. And what's happening, a lot of people, they don't realize it, but, they start parenting actually a lot of the ways that were the way their parents were kind of parented them and times and situations are very much different from before and now. And some of the discussions obviously today we're looking at maybe some of the technological advancements of technology, mm -hmm. social media, which didn't exist in our time growing up or the generations before. And, you know, those things have to be taken into account and we can't usually apply the same methods and the same means of parenting that we've done before to now. And so that was the kind of key area that I realized that there is a massive gap with fathers. And naturally, you know, if, if I, in the way I look at it is the provisions that are already out there and the topic of parenting very much attract mothers and mothers very much, anything that is out there is currently delivered by mothers. And so naturally fathers may not be able to fully connect because, you know, the roles are different, expectations are different, um, feelings and emotions, a lot of things are quite different. A motherly bond to a child is very different to a fatherly bond to a child. Um, and so that's why I kind of wanted to focus on that because alhamdulillah I've seen there is a growing trend, especially with those who are born and brought up here or growing up in the, in, in the West and not necessarily from um, uh, other kind of uh, countries of origin, that they are becoming more and more attuned to the fact that parents, you know, to parent a child in today's society requires both parents and not just one. And there is a keen interest to those who are becoming, you know, finding Dean, and practicing deen, they know that actually they've got a very, you know, serious concern about the child's welfare, their iman and their development. And so it is a growing thing where fathers being involved, but at the same time, they don't know maybe how to do things or what to do. And so a lot of that is about trying to help and guide and uh, guide them. And parents actually have the answers themselves. Uh, you know, I'm never there to say, I know better than you. You as a parent know your children best. And in fact, you have the resources in your hands, but sometimes you don't realize what you have or you're not too sure maybe how to use it. And that's what I try to do, help to guide, um, to empower, really. That's the main aim, to empower, to upskill parents and um, to kind of, as I mentioned before, be more involved and nurturing to the children. Mm -hmm. So that's the kind of reason why I've done that focus. Because I'm a father, I can relate a lot more. And I do find that fathers do are more engaging because of the fact that I am a father and I can relate to them. Um, and so that's why I wanted to kind of really try and and focus a lot on there while as at the same time supporting the wider kind of 
uh, Muslim community. I can I can kind of mirror that in the work that I'm doing in the sense that you'll get some parents who will say, my child is troublesome here, I want to push her into counselling or him into counselling. And then the parents just kind of step away as if it's just kind of isolated to the child and they're not connected in any way. And often what I have to do is I have to kind of entertain that and allow the child to come in but then by about the third session I'm bringing in the parents in because I know it can't work one without the other yeah. um, and then you get the types of parents who take it all on themselves you know everything is about them and they can't separate so anything that happens with their child it must be because of me it must be something that I've done must be something, and they become so internalized with that that they can't separate themselves and come up with strategies and things because it's so within the, within themselves so mm. I see both that and then the third element I do see is this where it lies either with the mother, you know, bringing the child and I don't even see the father anywhere, you know, it, and it's kind of what's going on in the house, you know, because that's going to play a big part in how that child's showing up. So you have to right. So I think the work that you're doing is, is phenomenal and um, may Allah, you know, put Barakah into it. And this is why I wanted to have this conversation because I could do it, but it's nice to hear from, you know, a male you know, Muslim brother, plus with your background. And so the first question that I had, and one of the reasons I reached out to you is one of the main things I'm, I'm um, being approached with is when we're in the tween ages and they've got technology and then we've got things like, I, mean, I don't even know half of them, but honestly, but we've got Instagram, TikTok, and there's some others that I don't even know of. Um, and parents are finding it difficult to know how much they should give their child which ones they're scared if they stop them then they're going to feel deprived and lie and go and do it anyway um but then if they give it to them then there's the whole fear of you know what are they learning the music the influence so i'm just looking at the conversation around what can we do as parents when we've got these children growing up in an environment where there's social media where they've got access to these things they're more savvy than we are on mm. most of the, most of the you know um so how can what can we do as parents to safeguard our children and feel like we've got some strategies in place to do that within and keep them within their deen yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, it's a very deep, deep question, I think. Mm. And there's many, many different angles it can be approached on. But um, one of the key things I always will go back to, and I said with anything um, we look at, these issues are the branches um, that come out from the tree. So we have to kind of go back to the tree and back to the roots. So if the roots are, are firm and are solid, then everything that comes from it. And we can use the analogy that Allah mentions in the Quran, where Allah talks about um, the goodly word and the goodly tree. And the comparison between a, a good word here, obviously, and then you've got um, the badly word, which is kufr and disbelief. Um, mm -hmm. And the, the, the difference is that with the, with the goodly word is deeply rooted. So it talks about how it's taking root in Iman and the parable Allah gives. And then the tree grows up, reaching the skies and, the, and bearing its fruits. So similarly, that whatever the fruits the tree bears, it could be good fruits or it could be evil and bad fruits. Um, but all of those go back down to the, the roots. And the, the root of the issue here is actually the relationship between the parent and the child. And I always would say that, that with anything that you do, if we want to build good children, we want to develop children who are built on Iman, those who pray Salah, who love Salah, who love Quran. And we have all of these high aspirations, but the foundation of it all is actually the relationship between you and your child. And this goes back to the term and the concept of, obviously, of tarbiya. The, the role of a parent is to provide tarbiya to the child. And a lot of the times we've conflated the term tarbiya with ta'lim. And ta'lim meaning the, effectively what we think is tarbiya is actually ta'lim. And we're not providing the tarbiya. So by ta'lim, we're talking about the actual learning, the learning you take place, the academic. You could, if you want to make a look at the academic process. So teaching your child... For example, um, there's two examples I use with the Salah. So teaching your child the arkan of Salah. So you might tell them about how to uh, uh, raise the hand, um, to, to where, where they hold the hand or where they do the ruku and the way they do the sujood and the tashahud. We teach them these things. So teach them the pillars of Salah, how to pray Salah. This is ta'lim, the teaching of that. The tarbiyah is actually making that come alive. And an example would be that uh, of the difference between tarbiyah and ta'lim is when your child finishes salah, if you embrace your child and then you ask him, what did you make dua for when you were in sujood? That's tarbiyah. 
that is the nurturing, that's the growth of the salah. The salah is a ritual, it's an action, isn't it? But it's filled with, uh, uh, filled with the iman, it's filled with connection with Allah, and it's filled with a lot more things. So that's the kind of nuance and the difference between, say, the ta'lim and the tarbiyah. Tarbiyah is to nurture and to grow and help that grow. And um, likewise, Sheikh Salman Auda was, was asked the question in regards to what is, uh, how do I get my child to love salah? And the Sheikh's answer what to that was, get your child to love you. Because if they love you and the connection with you is strong and your amal is also good, then they will naturally replicate that. And whatever you say, they will follow. But when the relationship is weak, then what comes thereafter is, is basically becomes an uphill battle. So these issues that we face with our children, a lot of them is because there's a breakdown in the relationship we've had with them. Um, and you can go really deep into this issue, you know, yeah. into obviously the psychology of it. Um, and there's a good book that, again, um, that you could read some of it, it's quite lengthy and maybe repetitive, but one's called um, uh, Hold On To Your Kids, um, Why Parents Matter More Than um, The Peers, yeah, by um, Gabba Mate and I forgot the other author, Gordon, it's with the N, and I forgot, they, they both wrote the book. Yeah. Now, this is a very important concept that, again, I would, I would suggest pe uh, people do read, those who are viewing do read, because it actually discusses about the relationship from the infants, from when the child in the first three years of the relationship between parent and child, how that is such an important stage. And then obviously it talks a bit lot more about peers and the interaction. But a lot of that case is we've made mistakes along the way. And sometimes we're in a position now our children, our relationship has, isn't strong. It's broken. Um, and because of that, now when we ask them to do things, things break down. Where, um, this is where there maybe sometimes they're lying, the secrets, the deceit, um, the trust being broken. This is what's happening now. But it doesn't mean it's all over just because we've, we've maybe missed the chances in the first five, ten, whatever so years. It can still be uh, mended and fixed, and we can still go forward and repair that. And so, yeah, because go ahead. Sir. Just, yeah. I have a, a quick reflection on that. So it reminded me of, you know, um, the hadith where let them play for seven years and then teach them for seven and then befriend them. And so when I do some of the work with parents, those seven years when they say, you know, we let them play, they think it's just putting them in the nursery and then they played like we didn't let them do anything. And it's kind of re-educating saying, no, those years are real bonding years to really get to know your child, to spend time. And it is true that when, 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 when we're looking at the child and we're looking at the parent often that parent was absent and it's mm. not just work like where I'm at work or I'm doing something but absent in terms of kind of mindfulness you know in in being so busy in doing things that we're not present with the child in the daily activities that they're doing I think that plays a big part as well so we can think of absence as oh I was at work for eight hours but even when you're home there wasn't that mindfulness so when you're doing so like, it's like, oh, let's get it done. Let's get, you know, fed. Let's get to bed without being with the child to experience each of those, you know, rituals that we're doing, that we're eating and we're talking or we've done the salah as you described. That was a beautiful example. Um, and I think that's a really important part. So at any given stage to try and build that with our children. And that takes time. But I also think it takes as parents, I mean, as, as a mother, as I'm, as I'm listening to you, a sense of slowing down and being mindful of my own emotions and what comes up and how I'm challenged and how I interact in any given stage when they're going to be emotional, they're going to come up with all sorts of things and how I respond to that. Um, and it's something that you said earlier, and I actually wrote it down where you said it needs a combination of love, but amal as well. So we could have all the love, but then if we're not, we're not practicing as much as we can teach, if we're not doing the things that we're saying, honestly, give them eight or nine, they'll say, you're not doing that. You mm. know, mama, how come you didn't? And she'll say to me, like, how come you didn't do that? And, you know, and it's, it's your children start to teach you what they need. And I think that's why I say to parents, really slow down. And it's not a criticism because if you start using it as criticism, then there's shame and then you don't want to address it. And shaitan comes in and whispers and it divides mm -hmm. you. But instead just address that, you know, actually, Perhaps I'm not present. Perhaps I am exhausted in certain areas. Perhaps there's other things that I need to address. And I say this to, to mothers particularly. If you've got other stresses um, in the relationship or with work, look at that as well because it, all of it impacts into how you're going to be dealing with your child. And they're observing you at all times. So you want to be loving your salah. You want to be loving the things that you do in your daily tasks. And that takes a lot of mindfulness. And being aware, so even if you're cooking, say, no, I love cooking for my family. Allah loves for us to look after each other because you are in that place of calmness and you're aware of the 
the connection with Allah, then your children are able to see that and then it, it drips into the children. And I think that's just, I just wanted to kind of interject into that because that's something I yeah. notice in the work that I do and, and helping parents in that regard. Yeah, definitely. Because one of the issues we tend to have, we, we're kind of going to go on to a bit more discussion about technology and stuff. But mm. it's, it's that thing of even when our children are present and they're seeking and they're craving our attention, a lot of the times in the younger years as well, we're not giving them that attention. And we're also indirectly teaching them a lot of things. So the dangers are there. We all fall into the traps, which is basically even our own mobile phones. How much are we basically engaged within the phones in the presence of our children? Mm. And what ends up happening is the more we're using the phone, in their presence when we should be present with them and talking with them engaging with them it ends up basically in the long term teaching our children that the phone is more important than relationships the phone is more important than conversation and so when they start now using the phone and they don't turn up at the dinner table and when they start using the phones in their in their rooms it's only a byproduct of what we've already basically um, done they're just copying our actions so we don't realize those they're harmful and we all slip into it because a lot of the times it happens that and some days you could be really busy with something. It's really important. It can be, uh, a lot of the times it is very much maybe really important stuff. So it's about finding that mechanism where we can switch off and having allocated and dedicated time and creating that. And so there may be days in that tree where you may be busy, but if you have a certain routine in place, then you can manage that. And um, some of the things that we do try at home uh, with me and my wife, which is that we try and uh, when the children are home, so after school um, and before bedtime, we try and put our phones away. So we have got like a basket, which is specifically for the phones. We put the phones away and leave it there. Um, obviously, if an emergency happens and there, there are kind of um, clauses to that, but generally speaking, it's put away. So we're not distracted. So that big distraction, when, when that, once that's gone, is a massive step for us to now be present. But you've also addressed it a lot of the times, even without the phones, our minds may be elsewhere. We let the, you know, the best way to understand it is khushu, really. That, you know, we talk about salah and being mindful in salah and having khushu, you know, in salah and being present that Allah is there. We're, we are standing in front of Allah and conversing with him and all of those things. We don't have that. So similarly, you know, having that khushu, that being actually present when our children are there and not thinking about that work or that conversation or those tasks that I need to get done or those other problems that you do have, but trying your best to be there. And the more we can practice that, the more our children actually really do appreciate that. It doesn't always mean you have to do something. You could be just, like I said, be there, just joke with them, talk with them. And you mentioned, kind of t touched upon it. One of the worst problems we have as parents is that we don't talk to our children. The only talking we have in conversation is to either um, to reprimand them or to depart instructions. So we're telling them off or we're telling them do something. You know, uh, thereafter you think through, if you just, re just pause and recount our day and think, okay, today, how many times I spoke to my children? And then you work out, okay, have I actually spoken? Have I actually conversed? Have we talked? Have I got to know them? Have we, you know, talked about different things, learned, whatever it may be? And you'll find that actually maybe sometimes we haven't. And that's a clear thing. And the child picks up on that because they think, oh, you're only there to tell me what to do or to tell me what not to do. Mm -hmm. And you don't really care for me. And that has a massive impact. And that was break down the relationship with the children. And just another point to kind of add on, which is with the relationship is also, while we focus on the relationship, like you said, you know, use the earlier years to play with them, to interact, to bond with them. Um, and that play doesn't mean that it's just play and not learning. And this comes onto another area of academics and education and how we actually educate our children. But we should spend a lot more time in the first years. And m many studies and many uh, examples exist that actually children, you know, there's places in Sweden, in Norway, some places in Germany, um, that actually start formal education from the age of seven. Because in this country, we've got education that starts from really nursery, because say three. And now, even then, they're actually putting in some form of learning of learning phonics and there's a push on learning these numbers and times tables. But actually, if we say, okay, from the age of five, it kind of starts from year one, because reception is even then, if the child doesn't go, it's not a problem, technically. Mm -hmm. um, but we start at such a young age on the formal learning, and children aren't actually ready for that. And in those ages, and if you look at the examples within Norway and, and, and like Sweden, that they start a bit later, they start at seven. And that's when children are attuned to actually learn. And what they do in the seven years prior to that is the learning is a kind of learning through play. Mm -hmm. And that's what, if, and so similarly, if we were to think of it like that, our children actually in the first seven years, we should be speaking with them, encouraging them, learning and learning through play. And when they come to the next kind of stage, thereafter, this is when a bit more formal learning can take place. 
and a bit more kind of uh, kind of building uh, the, those foundations for our children take place in those stages and we sometimes get them all wrong um sometimes we try and, and i've seen cases where we try to get our children you know we really we're really zealous and we want to get them to start loving salah so then they're at a young age at five or at four we're trying to force them to basically pray with us and sometimes they're rebellious they don't maybe they do but then what ends up happening is actually over time it can be a harmful process yeah, and that's what so... the, hadith, the hadith even mentions about from seven it doesn't necessarily mean okay yeah just that but there's a wisdom also behind teaching from the age of seven mm. and then if they don't pray by the age of 10 to chastise and to kind of reprimand them and that that's what the hadith goes on about so there there are wisdoms behind why not why not five and why not say four and so on because at those ages children aren't attuned yet for full learning and sometimes we miss that and we push them off and, and that's what causes the breakdown in the relationship in the early years and they have a detrimental impact in the teenage years and the latter years that we see with our children, long-term relationships when they're adults as well. And there's a big impact that happens from there. Um, so th- that, that's something, um, sorry, my mind's kind of going in quite a few different uh, ways. But the other important thing is, is for a good relationship with the children is also about instilling values. Mm. And a lot of the times we're not necessarily value-driven. Um, and this is a very important thing that we could really uh, kind of work on. Uh, if we have values and the values are very clear, then children, as they grow up, they know what they are. And the values are effectively also our rules. You know, what is it, what, what's allowed, what's not allowed. And they're based on values. And our values are derived from divine values. The, the values Allah has revealed to us um, through the Quran and through the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You know, we, this, this is what we have. And this is how we determine what's right and what's wrong, what's immoral and what's immoral. Mm-hmm. And they're things that we have to really put into place. And I actually did a webinar um, not too long ago. Um, it's available on, on my YouTube channel. You see, it's called Instilling Values. And we actually discussed this in a lot more detail for those who wish to kind of get more information on it. But here it's talking about a couple of things of instilling values. One is actually a, a creation uh, and a model that works. And I've done it at home and many others have do it. Is about creating a family mission statement. Now, what happens with a family mission statement and... Actually, this is something which is very much talked about in depth by Stephen Covey in his book, Seven Habits of Highly Effective Families, um, which is a a kind of adaptation of his famous book, which is Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. And in there, he mentions a lot more detail about the the creation of a family mission statement. Now, what ends up happening here is it's about all the family coming together, um, putting the ideas together of who we are as a family. Um, What is it we're trying to achieve? Because a lot of times what happens as a family is we get married. You know, as a as a natural product of a process of life, that we know that what is our role? We're children. We grow up. We get married. What's the next process? We have children, and it almost seems that we're doing something because we know this is what we're supposed to do, but we don't know where we're heading. You know, we don't know the destination. We're kind of ambling through life. What is the plan for our family? You know, what is the plan? Uh, you know, as, as a husband and wife, what's your plan as a couple? What's the plan is when you have children, where are you heading, what are you are trying to do? And so this is effectively what we're trying to achieve through the family mission statement. Having it clear, these are the values that are enshrined in, our, in us. This is what we're trying to achieve. So it's a, it's a compass, it's a final destination. It almost acts as a constitution of your house. And I've seen family mission statements being on different spectrums. Some could be a, a word, a phrase, it can be a list. And, you know, alhamdulillah, what I did with our children is we had a set of questions, we took time, they went away, they went through it, they reviewed it. Like examples like, who are our heroes? Who do you want to be like? Well, what makes us want, happy to come home? What is the thing that we love about our family? What is it that we don't like about our family? Um, uh, what kind of house would we like to invite our friends to? Um, all of those things kind of, they prize out different questions and answers and we put them all together. So all of my children came together, they put input and everybody's views were heard and every idea was kind of taken on, or being, uh, the, uh, the palatable ideas were taken on board and we made a family mission statement and that became the value in the constitution of our house that we know that this is who we are and these are what the things that we live up to and thereafter what happens is we have uh, tagged on with that we have weekly family meetings and by having these family meetings and in these meetings they actually also looked at like almost like a tarbiyah as well for them and some learning ta'lim. so I, I have a very short session maybe five minutes I'll go through a hadith reflect, okay, what is everybody's ideas? And it's not preaching, it's more of a discussion. What do you understand by this hadith? What does it mean to you? What does it mean to us? And then we put that all together. Um, and then 
my one of my children will rotate and they have a little uh, they they will share uh, they will read up on a life story maybe of a sahabi or a prophet and they share some bits so they're also kind of learning and and, and giving and sharing and then we go through our week and we have a lot of discussion and then we also reflect back on the family mission statement and say okay from here what are the what is the one thing we want to focus on for the week ahead and really really ensure we kind of build on that so it could be one of them could be to be charitable for example so we say okay right this week we're going to be very charitable okay, how can we be charitable it's not always about finance it can also be through for actions that we do so we focus on it for this week to be very very charitable and we give uh, in the in, in basically in all the different ways we can and then review it how did the week go we have to do that okay what's the next kind of thing we can do so it keeps it alive and constant and it's always a reminder it's framed up it's on the wall now, these are small things that if they're done and implemented and continually exist, they help to build and uh, children become clear because children need to know boundaries. And we don't know boundaries. And a lot of the times, these boundaries that we set, parents, children don't understand why. So a child comes to us and says, can I have this? We say no. So a child's thinking, it's unfair. My friend has it. You know. So if we don't explain to them why, what's the logic behind it? Why did it happen? Why we say no? It could be, and a lot of the times, they're value-driven reasons. And we just need to explain it and uh, kind of process that for our children, for them to understand. If they always know these are the values we hold, then as we go through the decision, they can they can understand themselves and see, okay, this makes sense. This is related to that value. And there was a very beautiful video, actually, <clears throat> um, and I can share the link with you. You can share it with your audience later uh, by um, um, Justin Colson. So he's, he's also like a child psychologist and he's a parenting um, expert as well from... Um, Australia and again he's from a Christian kind of uh, background he's written a few books as well which were quite useful books um, but he had a little video and in the video he talks about uh, an interaction between him and his daughter and I always use the example of seeing values come alive mm. his 17 year old daughter and he says it very nicely but in the gist of it, he's saying she's driving the car she's quite upset he can sense she's upset she says what's wrong she then explodes saying I was invited to this party but basically there's a party happening but I wasn't invited the reason I was invited because I'm your daughter. And he goes, okay, right. And so then he he, he felt a bit like, okay, uh, a bit upset. Then she, he probed a bit more, said, okay, well, you're not invited because most likely there was going to be some sort of alcohol happening. And, you know, and she said, yeah, any drugs, yeah. And <laughs> boys and girls going off doing something in the middle of the night, possibly, yeah. Then you can under, because I understand why, because it's something against our value. And that's when she turned around and she says, she goes, I hate them. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Um, or, or she said, I hate them, or I don't like them. Yeah, I think she said, I don't like them. And then he, at that time, thinking, oh, no, something's going to drop. But then she said the next word, which was that, I, I don't like them, but I think we should keep them. Yeah, she and so she understood that these values, even though they're affecting her life because she's maybe not able to interact in the way she would do with her peers and, and live the life that they're living, but she at the same time understood the value of these values, basically. And she was able to make that judgment. So she became effectively a self-regulating child. And that's what we're trying to achieve. We're trying to inculcate in our children to become self-regulating. And the only way they can be self-regulating, knowing what's right from wrong. And in later in life, making that decision that actually I shouldn't do this. This is against my values. Is by think, instilling them from a young age. I think what you've shared is so beautiful because I was going to actually lead on to that around um, a lot of the parents coming and saying they're lying to me. And what I'm finding is the moment that the child lies, the parent reacts. So it's something within themselves. And then they want to go into discipline, which basically means punishment. And then they wonder why, you know, I can't believe you lied to me. I can't believe you did this. I told you not to go on that. And it's everything against what we've what you've just shared. Um, and I try to go back to that, which is, if we go back to the values, children are actually really, you know, their, their fitra is there. They know good and bad. It's just a matter of this process. And I loved the actual practical way that you've, you've shown us today in terms of the family values. Um, in terms of the lying, it's essentially saying, look, you know, lying, if I, even if I'm not there, somebody's watching you and who is that they've got to feel that within themselves they've got to say that it feels wrong if if a child deletes something 
then they've deleted it because they obviously thought that there was something wrong in doing that. They've deleted it because they either felt that, oh, if I don't delete it, I'm going to get in a lot of trouble, yet they want something. So they're going through a moral decision. And I think the job for us as parents is to recognise that our job is to help them to understand that moral dilemma and not to go in and to say, this is wrong, this is right, because they'll never learn. They'll always wait for us to just to tell us. And they get used to that. So when, when I'm dealing with kind of older children, they get used to, oh, well, that's just going to shout I don't care because they get used to just filtering that I'm going to get shouted at it's okay but I can still do what I wanted to do but they've learned nothing from it so I think what you've just shared is amazing it was one of the questions that I had around as they get older should a child lie to you how do we prevent that and you've explained that beautifully and if you want to expand on that then I, you know please do so yeah, yeah. You, you, you've, you've, t- you've touched upon it which is that um Children tend to lie for two reasons. One is because uh, they've done something wrong or they know they've done something wrong. The other one is they know that you won't approve of whatever it is that they've done and they, and they wish to hide that from you. Mm-hmm. Now, children naturally, uh, as they grow, they, they push boundaries because they need to know okay, um, what they can do and they can't do. So it's important that we do have clear boundaries. And at the same time, we maintain those boundaries and we're consistent in maintaining those boundaries and not sometimes allowing it, sometimes not, because that also causes confusion within our children and they're not aware, okay, maybe I'm allowed, maybe I'm not. So, and like so I said, what, they... Yeah. What tips could we give to parents? Because that is something that parents really do struggle with and it's some work that I do. But are there any tips that you've got on helping parents to stay consistent for themselves first and foremost and then for their children as well? Because I do find that when, when they're pushed, they're just like, okay, just do it. Or children are very clever. So you're doing something and they'll ask you just as you're doing something. You don't even realize that you said yes to them. And then later on, well, you said I could do this. Or mm. they look for the gray area. So I had one where a specific person had, you know, the mother had said, you're not allowed to go on this. And she said, oh, I thought you said I'm not allowed to go on this particular part of this, you know, and it's that clarity. And, and, and then she just kind of looked really innocent. And I, I thought, no, she knew very well. Mm. But at that point, she had just decided that I'm going to go even more pedantic, even further into that. So is there some tips that you could give us to help us, you know, yeah. as parents to put those in and then to transfer that onto our children? Yeah. Um kind of what i mentioned before in terms of um values is an important part once you know you're clear that thing that you have your values that these are the values that we hold on to the next one is is also not reacting all the time because what ends up happening is um when we're in a heated situation we snap or react we all do it you know i'm guilty of it as well not no one's perfect um and those things do happen so the most important thing we could try and do is pause whenever a situation happens is to pause because what can happen is we can be sometimes overly harsh on a punishment and then not see it through. So your child's done something wrong. We say, that's it. You're going to, I don't know, lose your whole day or something, whatever it may be. And then what ends up happening is you realize, okay, that's also not practical. And then afterwards you let it go. So what happens is the child can see you're not being consist- consistent. And then also they know that, oh, don't worry, dad said this or mom said that. They'll they kind of... Uh, um, kind of uh, drop it afterwards uh, or you know I'll get through it anyway it doesn't matter they're just basically blowing off some steam so it's important that if we can pause that helps us to be consistent because then instead of reacting we actually are, are thinking and then acting and it's important we're not we're not all in reactionary mode because a lot of times that's what happens somebody pokes up children poke up button we then basically give a reaction of something that's basically unrealistic so that really helps just to pause and to reflect and to make sure that's there and also a lot of the times what you can do that helps beforehand is to actually have it written up that and your children also being aware of it if you do this crime you know this this is the punishment yeah or this is this is what's going to happen this is the consequences that people don't like using the term punishment it's interchangeable whichever it may be but if you're going to for example if you don't this is what you have if you do this this is the outcome you know and and if if the children know what it is and you know what it is then what happens is it helps you. You can even write it down if you, if you forget. And then that enables you to be consistent because as long as a, a, a reprimand or the boundaries that you put around are consistent and, and achievable, then it's okay. So it could be that an example is if a child does something wrong, it's like, okay, fine, they miss, I don't know, 10 minutes of their screen time. And then they do it again, another 10 minutes, and then another 10 minutes. And then it, obviously it accumulates, it adds up. Instead of saying, you're not going to watch at all today, which then might be very unrealistic. And then it's like, okay, that, then what happens is they do another action, which is even worse than the one before. So what are you going to do now? 
Um, I'm out of options. So, okay, you're going to miss next week and then the week after. And then when's that happening? They've got a whole lifetime ban of, of watching and it's not real. So again, making it real and manageable, um, those things are, and, and that's also linked with the fact that you're able to pause and reflect and, and just think, okay, let me just take a deep breath before I say something, before I do something. It's a hard thing to do because obviously at that time, Shaitan's there and just poking you and you know making it kind of enraged even more. Um, so it's not an easy task uh, by all means, but this is what we can try uh, our best to practice and that would help us to kind of be consistent because most of the time anything that we are inconsistent about is because we're doing it at a stage where the emotions are high. And that kind of links in, which is that the understanding of discipline, discipline is, we have to understand discipline is education. It's not punishment and we shouldn't see in that light. And so and at the same time, we cannot effectively discipline our children when our emotions are high or even their emotions are high. Yeah. yeah, so that education can't take place. So that means we have to be calm and the children then have to also be calm and then we can have that process of educating, which is basically what disciplining is, um, where they learn right from wrong. Um, and th- that, that's an important point around the boundaries. Just touching on something you spoke about earlier is, would, would it be valuable, um, and I do this, so I'm asking, is, is whenever I'm um, putting in a, a discipline, so when I know that they've got a lesson to learn in that, it's often I'll tell them why I'm doing that. Um, so I'll say, okay, you know, because of this, we're gonna have, I'm going to be doing this. You know, I still love you, but I'm going to have to do this because you knew that that wasn't supposed to happen. Um, and I always sort of, engage them in even that and it kind of almost they almost receive it as if it's something good like okay mama you know and I'm like, this is a punishment but they see it as I'm still with them um, and I always say to them I'm not doing this to hurt you but if I don't do this then you learn nothing from it you'd continue to do that and then I ask them kind of what do you think the purpose of this is and it was because I did this it's because I you know and why was that wrong and it's because of this reason and actually I I shouldn't have done that because it's not good for me or back to the morals and the things that you talked about, the ethics that we have in our families. Is that something that's advisable? Or can we do that at a certain age with children? What would you say? Hmm. Yeah, um, that, that, that is an important point because any sort of education that takes place, it does require the child, child in the end to reflect, to understand. But the key important point that we need to ensure that mm-hmm. that education can only really happen when emotions are not high. So if you're in a heated situation now, um, your child is really like emotional. Now, if you talk to them, nothing's going in. It's going in, coming out. They don't care. They're not learning at all. So what needs to happen is don't feel pressured that you have to educate them there and then. Pause, leave it. If, if you're going to say there's a certain this uh, uh, kind of uh, reprimand that's going to happen, then alhamdulillah, let that be. Do that. See it through. Go through that. Let them calm down. And when, this, when the time has shifted, when their mind has shifted away from that incident. And children are very quick. A lot of the t- generally, as they get older, it slows down. But when they're younger, it's the case of that something happens, they're upset. And within a second, they flip back and they're happy and they're playing again. As they get older, they hold on to it a bit more or longer, longer, and the grudges. And we know as adults, when you get to adulthood, you know, you can be upset for a very, very long time. Um, but when you're a child, you know, you can go very quickly. So allow that situation to change. They might go into another time. And once things are calm, then you talk with them and say, okay, what happened last uh, an hour ago? What happened two hours ago? Whatever it may be. Why do you think it happened? Mm-hmm. Let them explain. Okay, what do you think was happening? What was I doing? What were you doing? Mm-hmm. And what happened? And then what happened is they can, they can learn. That reflection can take place. But when the emotions are high, then really education is happening. And sometimes what might happen is they may give you lip service just to get, get through. Okay, fine. Just to, oh, I need to shut her up. Almost that comes in mind. Okay, fine. Uh, we just basically um, don't say nothing. And then we just, uh, and then they just say whatever they like and we end the situation. So it's important. There is a, there is a method. Now, the more you read around parenting, and I always get this question. Um, some people say, do this. And some people say, don't do that. Some people say, do this method. And then that's, we find another book that says, don't do that method. Almost a refutation of that method and say, this is wrong. So how do parents, it's such a confusing matter. Like, okay, how do I approach it? And not, especially around discipline. Now, um, a lot of times, what I've always said is, if you look at this issue of discipline, you have to kind of also go back to basically our religion and say, okay, does this exist or not? Now, I'm not talking about the specific methods that exist, but I'm talking about the principle or the general kind of understanding. Now, disciplining, yes, it exists in Islam. 
you know, there's many hadith the Prophet talked about it. Um, even we talked about the salah issue before. You know, the hadith is a bit more explicit in how it's translated, but the ulama have mentioned that it should be, a, a, basically it's reprimanding them. It's actually, you know, putting some sort of discipline in place. There's a hadith that was even more very kind of open that said, uh, hang, your, hang the whip in a place, I can't remember the exact, I'm just paraphrasing the hadith, but hang your whip in the house so it can be seen and it acts as a deterrent. So I mean, children understand that hang on to me, there's a consequence, you know, and those things were there. Now, you know, the point is, the Prophet at the same time, we realize, Prophet Salaam, he never said a, a negative word towards a child, nor did he ever hit or do anything like that. That shows that it actually can be also at the same time done without having to use physical or, or, or kind of verbal abuse towards a child. So it can be done. The Prophet Salaam did that. Um, uh, Anas radiallahu anh, spent nine years with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, and he said not once in that nine years I spent with him did the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam say to me why did you do this or why didn't you do that mm-hmm. and if you think back at our, you know, when we parent we all say to our children why did you do this or why you know, we say that it comes out so naturally and you think the Prophet sallallahu never once did he say that mm-hmm. and so it is amazing but it is doable and that shows that it is a process in a way but at the same time punishment isn't something that is completely gone it is still there as an option at the end, you know, of, of, of the spectrum. And that's the best way I've come across to kind of balance this understanding. And so there are methods. And one of the methods I always do encourage, and I said that it's, it's called one, two, three magic. Yeah. There's a book mm-hmm. and you can, you, you can read up on it. And this is a process I've done with my children and, it, and I've always advocated it and it works, mm-hmm. but it's an important process to, that it works is that before, and then start, and they say you can start from the age of two, but I've never found two to be a reasonable age. I think three is a better age, to be honest, where the child understands better. Um, but, um, or, or uh, but, and it goes up to about 30, 12, um, age of 12. So basically before the teenage years. But the, the whole concept of one, two, three magic was that it keeps you calm. It ensures that the issue that's been happening has been dealt with. Um, and stops and then thereafter you can do some learning and education takes place a lot of the times what happens is we react in a negative way because our children are doing something it's winding us up it's winding us up we might be on a phone call we might be cooking in the kitchen and they're doing something they're doing something and then the next thing you know we just go we explode and then that's it you know give some very severe punishment um so instead of doing that process what can be done is that we take a you know all we do is we, before we do this process we speak sit with our children and we explain to them is look you don't like it when maybe I shout or you don't like it when this happens. So let's come to a mutually agreeable process. When you're doing something, it may be a situation that I don't like or you're doing something I don't like. All I'm going to do is I'm going to come in, I'm going to raise my finger and say, that's a one. You know, and then, and then, and then my expectation is you stop what you're doing. Now you might continue what you're doing or you might even chat back and say, but mom or but dad, I, you can't even say, but just, just to be quiet. Okay, they retaliate, they talk back, you say, okay, that's a two. Again, you wait, you remain calm, you're firm. You're calm and you're firm. And then something still continues or whatever it is, then you say, okay, that's a three. And that's what we call a timeout. Now, we've heard of timeout before. But timeout is the basic way you don't have to even say why or anything. You just say, okay, fine. The process we have in our house is we have stairs. So we say, okay, you go and sit on the stairs. You sit on there for the number of minutes that is your age. Yeah? So it's not discriminating in any way. It's, it's, it's kind of based on their thing. So they stay there, and then they, once they finish, they come back and they can join whatever activities it was. Now, what you see is the moment they do this once or twice, straight away by probably the third time, the moment you say that's a one, they stop what they're doing. They just literally stop. And there's, the reason why is because children are getting taken away from their, their fun and activity that they're having. And they don't like that constant disruption. And then they go, oh, forget it. I don't want that disruption. They stop what they're doing. It stops you from shouting, and then it keeps things calm and easy. But then you think, okay, fine, the child... You know, they haven't learned anything, have they? They've just gone away, they come back. But well, then this is what you do is you don't deal with the issue then because the emotions are still high. So naturally, if a child is sitting on the stairs having a, their time out, if you go and talk to them, they're not going to be listening. So you let it go, leave it be. It's not, it doesn't mean that just because it's happened there and then you have to deal with it there and then. You stop the issue, you stop the bickering, you stop the bad behavior. But then what happens is later on when things are calm, and I've done that several times, it's heated, they've gone away. A bit later, my son is sitting there, he's happy and stuff. I sit with him, I say, okay, you know, an hour ago, you know, what happened? You know, what, and we discuss it, we go through it, and then they understand. And, and that reflection takes place and that learning does take place. And then they value that process. So that, that, that's, that's basically what we've, um, that, that process that works. So there's a book on it that explains it, but that's the general gist of it, that don't deal with the issue there and then. 
Because if you do, then the emotions are generally quite high. Let it, things settle and calm down, and then you can learn. That's why I said discipline is education. But then to educate your child, it can't be done when emotions are high in yourself or in your child. You both need to be calm, then you can learn. Um, similarly, if you think about it, when you're really angry, worked out at something, somebody's telling you like you did something wrong. At that time, you're not going to really sink in. Or for example, you have an argument. And I know we do this. For me, I might be, you know, like for example, I get angry with something and I say something out of place. Once I've calmed down, I realize, oh, what did I say? You know, or what did I do? And you can go back and say, okay, I'm sorry. But then the damage is kind of done, isn't it? So before we can try and have that process of doing so much damage to each other and then kind of repairing each other and leaving scars, that we can prevent that process from happening. Um, so yeah, that, that's just some some advice and some tips. And there is actually again same thing on instilling values. That that webinar in the beginning part of it, I discussed this method as well in a bit more detail. So you can view into listen, watch that, and get more information as well. What would you say to uh, there was a, a sister that put a question up about that, and I think you've answered it. But say the child doesn't calm down. You know they've been fighting. Mum's uh, you know busy with something. Dad's busy with something. You can feel the the irritation in the house. And you've put the child and said, look, we're going to have some time out, but it takes a long time for them to calm down. What would you do in that situation? Do you continue with the time out or do you pull them out and just, um, I'm a very nurturing mom, so I just kind of pick them up, hold them. I, I'm, I'm with them through that tantrum. And then once they're calm, I'm okay with that. I don't, I don't necessarily use the time out method, but I can understand when they were younger, I did use that you know but as they got a little bit older I didn't need it I just if she needs me I just go to her um but I I have I can remember my younger one she when she sets off it's that's it she just will not calm down until she's had that hug or that repair with me so what would you say we a parent could do if they're doing that method with the child and and they're not calming down is there anything else that we can put in place yeah a lot of it is also with that method, what happens mm -hmm. is you're also explaining to the child that, look, your time will start once you're calm, meaning yeah. you can't be having a tantrum, yeah? And they understand that. And that okay. means that sometimes they might sit there and they'll cry for 10 minutes and their time is only five minutes, for example, meant to be. Mm -hmm. Then once you're 10 minutes, if you've calmed down, then you can have your five minutes, you can go back. Okay. Now, what does happen here is, um, this is a bit where it comes from the issue of, obviously, um, the psychology of the child, which is that at that, that time, uh, is that your relation basically what it is is there's a breakdown in the relationship and you need to repair that relationship mm -hmm. so there are different and varying approaches um, and thoughts around that if the child still doesn't settle in their crime for a very long time and like you mentioned it means that they probably require that attention mm -hmm. and what well, like you mentioned you can go to hug hug with them but at the same time it means it's to calm them down to bring them down if you talk with them, it's still not going to work. So mm -hmm. don't think that the talking process is more about sometimes a child might need a lot more of a love and, and, and a physical touch for that to happen. Is that each parent knows their child. They, you, you, like I said, you know your child. I don't know mine. We know what will work. And sometimes in a situation, you can try those alternative um, approaches and techniques, which is that when somebody is very kind of, you know, emotionally very high and very upset, then it could be that they need a lot more intimacy with you so again, hug or just sitting there in silence, but just with them, you know, and, and those processes can work as well. But generally speaking, if they understand that, oh, they're going to have a little tantrum to calm down, you can allow that and see that through for a bit in order for them to kind of um, be calm and then basically work on that. Mm -hmm. Because what ends up happening is if you're always giving in, again, it goes back to boundaries. The boundaries are always broken and children won't know, okay, maybe if I keep on crying long enough, I'll, I'll get what I need at the end or I won't get punished and all of those kind of things. So it's important that we strike that balance that that isn't the case, that everything has a consequence. And if you've got rules, the rules need to be maintained and they need to be consistent. How, um, however, you just need to be mindful of the, the impact of how we're applying those rules. And it shouldn't be done out of um, anger. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. So part. we have to be at a calm. That's what yeah. I was saying, As I, you know, as I'm, I'm almost watching, you know, when I've worked with people, they, they're describing it as if the mother or the father at that point still wasn't calm. So they were saying, go and sit on there. But they weren't doing it from a place of, I'm trying to teach my child something. So they're angry, their um, emotional state isn't stable. 
and then they're trying to get their child to be stable and it's still you have to do that inner work you know you have to say okay I'm the leader here I'm going to be showing by example and even if that means you have to sit on the step for five minutes you know and it sounds but it is it's kind of okay I'm going to have to see this through because I'm the adult so therefore I'm going to have to calm myself down and know what my purpose is and see that through so that my child can follow through. Whereas if I'm going in all scary and I'm still yelling, I'm still shouting or I'm absent-minded and I've withdrawn, then how do I expect that child to either settle in or take any lesson from what I'm trying to teach them? So I think that, that's a key point, you know, yeah. that we Mod- have to be there. Yeah, modelling is a very important uh, obviously, aspect of parenting. And for example, you know, your child hits their sibling and then as a punishment, you hit them, yeah? So what have they learned? They've not learned hitting is wrong because you just hit them as a punishment. Mm-hmm. Or, for example, your child is shouting and you tell them to stop by shouting, yeah. you know? So obviously those, you know, it doesn't make sense. It's not logical. So you, it, it has to be kind of um, the opposite, effectively, or, or whatever their current model behavior should be. That's how it should be. So if you don't want to mm-hmm. shout, you need to say it with a firm voice. Firmness is important. But it doesn't necessarily mean having to, um, having to shout. And similarly, it doesn't mean resorting to a kind of physical chastisement, you know, um, of, of the child. Um, but they're, they're important. How you behave is an important thing that if you have to remain calm. So sometimes it means breathe, breathe a few seconds, pause, and then go in so you're calm and you're not reacting. Um, and that, that's something sometimes will work. Sometimes I've got to sit there, breathe a few times, deep breaths, mm. pause, and there's, okay, now I want to enter into the fray and try and deal with the deal with the issue. But it can be a lot. Like I said, you know, I know even in my household because there's six of them and sometimes they're just on top of each other and there's like three conflicts happening in one time. You know, it can be hard. It's not easy. Um, mm-hmm. And nobody's perfect. And that's something we should always remember because sometimes people might think, oh, mashallah, he's got it all worked out. His kids are all good. and all. It's not. We all have our problems um, and we all have our off days as well. But it's the point of we keep on trying. We keep on persevering in that process. And our children would acknowledge as they grow older, they acknowledge that consistency. We've tried. And we make mistakes. Mm-hmm. And many times I made mistakes. And sometimes I've shouted. And I realized, damn, I did that wrong. And this is the key thing I always say to parents. Never be ashamed to say sorry to your children. Yeah. And I do that. So many times I go back to my son and I say to him, um, that I'm sorry. Basically, what, how I reacted wasn't actually appropriate or wasn't right. Or I went too far or whatever it may be. You know, I'm sorry, like, can we kind of wipe this slip, clean start again? You know, and he, my son appreciates that. He knows that, look, we're human. We make mistakes. And it's an important point of actually apologizing to children because if we don't apologize to children and we're always right, because we might think, how can a parent apologize to a child? What's wrong with apologizing? We don't lose anything. We only, we might think, oh, they're going to think, oh, you made a mistake and you're not always right. But that isn't the case. What they learn is that you're human and human and adults can make mistakes because there is a, a an analogy that was given um, um, that I read in a book called the book um, you wish your parents had read and or something of that title. Mm-hmm. Um, but she gave a cool analogy regarding sorry, actually. And that's something which I used as well, giving her analogy, which is that if you don't say sorry to your child, then what ends up happening is they can learn, I'm not saying they will, but they can learn that adults don't make mistakes mm-hmm. and adults aren't wrong. So then what happens is when an adult may enter into a child's life who is there to harm your child and abuse them, they may feel I've done something wrong because an adult can never be wrong. Mm-hmm. And he can potentially open them up to abuse. Yeah. And we don't, if we, when we see it like that, then we realize, oh, hang on a minute, that's so true. So they have to understand that adults make mistakes. Adults can, okay, adults can, you know, uh, are, are not uh, infallible. They're fallible, and so that's we the process. What we see it with other the authorities as well. So in teachers, and when they're going into, you know, corporate world, or as they grow older, they often, even though they're adults and they're with other adults, they still position themselves that way. So if they've got a boss who says something, they're often not able to disagree because they have that still mm-hmm. that attachment from the the childhood. Um, I'm sorry to cut you off. We're, we're coming to the end of this hour. Yeah. Um, 
we could still jump back on for another 15 minutes if that's okay because Instagram only gives us now if you're okay to do that or would you like to end today how would you where are you at um, with your fine. energy I, can, I could uh, give another uh, yeah that's fine inshallah 15 just minutes 15 maybe. I won't do more than that because I just yeah. see if anybody's got any questions and then I just feel bad just co- coming off this way so I'll end it for now because it's at 30 seconds left and then I'll just join you back in if that's okay, okay. thank yeah, you very much inshallah. okay no thank you Thank you for going over for 10 minutes. I just didn't want to end that way. And I thought if anybody's got any questions. Um, So I think we have rounded off. There was one last kind of thing that I had, but I think um, it's just around when you were talking about the social media side of things initially, I can kind Mm. of link it into kind of setting up the values, but then there is the pressure. The children go to school, their friends have got devices. I mean, my daughter and I had the conversation about when does she have a phone? What would you say for us Muslim parents um, would be the best guidelines to support our children with everything that's going on in the world and then the home life on trying to instill in them what's right and wrong in terms of social media and giving them the tools to make those choices for themselves? Because I think it could be really difficult. It's addictive. All my friends are on it. It's fun. Um, So in their world, they can't say anything wrong. And it's very hard to sort of be the outsider, you know, be the stranger in in this world. So just that would Mm. have been my last question, really. Yeah. Yeah, no, that is an important point. Um, Similarly, there's a webinar I did on on screen time, which talks a bit about social media. Again, that can be viewed on uh, YouTube as well, um, which I discussed further. Mm. But I'll try to give a snippet of of that as well. Now, um, with social media, we have to understand is a lot of these social media apps, they've got an age limit to it mm-hmm. yeah, or a starting age. And the majority of them is from about 13. Some of them are actually even 16. Um, uh, and so we have to understand that. For example, WhatsApp is actually the age is 16. Wow. Yeah, but we know, of many, we know of many children who mm-hmm. obviously younger than that are using WhatsApp. Um, and with, uh, what do you call it, things like um, the other apps that are out there now, whether they're using um, like Instagram or Facebook or or what's it called, TikTok and so on, mm-hmm. and so many others, they start from the age of 13. Um, so a lot of the children, again, before that age are using it. Now, they've obviously put their age um, as, a, as a kind of a guide, but even then, that, that's from the, those who are making the apps. Um, so they're saying 13, um, and we know children are using it younger. And my main thing on social media is this, that social media is more harmful than beneficial, especially for children. Mm-hmm they don't have, their minds aren't ready yet to determine or distinguish right between wrong and they are easily influenced. So use of social media at a young age is very harmful and detrimental because it's effectively like giving your child drugs on the table and saying, here's some drugs, um, do what you like. And then they try it. Mm. You know, you can't dangle the candy in front of them and not think they're going to bite. Um, and so... That, that's an important thing that we need to take into consideration. And hence why I've always said that from the onset, if a relationship is strong, if the values are there and they understand all of those things, the next one is that we, we, we tell them that, look, social media isn't something you will be using. And you can only kind of get that later on in life and not beforehand. Um, so, for example, with my children, it made it very clear. So, look, the, the chance you'll be able to use some elements of social media will be when you're 16 and not before that. Mm-hmm. And they've made that clear. At the same time, that also ties in with the devices that they have. So they don't have smartphones, my children. Mm-hmm. You know, the, the only ones that have phones are the ones who are basically going to secondary school. Um, and that's because they go far away from home. It's a 45-minute journey on public transport, um, unless I drop them and pick them up. Now, on those times, they require a phone because of the length of the journey of the time and for safety reason. And so they'll have what we would call, you know, dumb phones, you know, the old kind of Nokia phones. They can only type, you can make a call, you can text, and you probably play snakes, you know, mm-hmm. you know that, that, that kind of phone. Um, and nothing more than that. And because the purpose of the phone is for me to communicate with them and vice versa. Um, and so because of that, they understand that now naturally a child as they grow they're going to see their friends using the phone and so we have those conversations they do pop up they're like oh you know my kid, this person got a phone that person got a phone and then we discuss and say look you know what our values are in our household you know what their values are mm-hmm. and at the same time i always do talk further and i say look you might know they might have a phone in the house but look at all the things that we have at home and in our family life that you know they don't have and they can list them and then they weigh it up and they realize look alhamdulillah we have a lot of things 
here. It doesn't mean objects. It means sometimes family. Look at the, you know, one of the questions I do ask, and I know most of the, my, my children say it themselves without me having to say it, but they know that, look, you know, they have so much time with me as their father, and they know that their friends don't have that kind of interaction with their father. You know, that is, you can't put money on that. Um, you can't put a, a price on that. And so they understand those kind of things and the value that they realize that we're actually getting a lot more than them, that. And then we do have the conversation. It will arise. We'll have that chat. And we we'll say, but I made it clear. I gave them a time. I said, when you're 16, mm. meaning when you're 16, yeah. in the summer, not when you turn 16, in the <laughs> summer of when you're 16, then, <laughs> then you get that. that. <laughs> you know, just, to, just to make it clear. So it means before you go to college, because that's the next step of their independence where mm. it will open up a bit more. And by that age, if they've got the tarbiyah and they've learned through that process, they'll be able to make better judgments mm. Not saying they're still ready yet because they're still young and they're still developing, but you have to allow them some room. But they can make a better judgment call than before that age. Mm-hmm. And so that's always the first step, I would say, is is basically abstinence, as they say. You know, stay away from it, don't, don't, don't tap into it. Now, however, what if you've already given your children a smartphone? What if you've already given them access to to the to the to the social media? Mm-hmm. One is, if you give them smartphone, don't give them social media. If you've already given them smartphone, they've already got social media, okay, what do I do next? Then it's about making sure you have the conversation about what's, you know, again, it goes back to values. What do we value? What's allowed? What's not allowed? So then you're talking about what apps are they using? What are they not using? And you have to educate them regarding what's happening on these apps, you know, because a lot of it can be down to the fact that children, especially girls, uh, being exploited, um, uh, groomed and, and those things are happening and the danger is actually not outdoors anymore it's indoors in your phone on the laptop on the tablets mm. and so them being educated and being aware of that and the harms are many because those harms aren't just regarding um, predators it's also exposure to for example things like pornography you know those things are quite rife you know um, there was a statistic that I saw that was published by uh, one of the major pornography websites that talked about the number of users they had via different devices Mm. and they looked at specifically games consoles Mm. and they saw that playstation xbox and all those things they had a high number mainly was playstation Mm. that was accessing their sites Mm. the majority of the users of these consoles are children so that means children are actually accessing these sites and they're viewing it and it's unknown to parents because they haven't got any restri- any, any rules or regulations around usage and, uh, and, uh, and what they're allowed to do and not do. And so you can see that, that there's a lot of dangers that come there. And sometimes parents don't know how to broach this topic of safety, body safety. And recently, I, actually, I, I published, I've got two books published. Um, uh, currently, the, the one that recently got published, they're both available on Amazon. And the latest one actually talks specifically, and it's an interactive book that you actually sit with your child, and it's designed for children who are 10 plus. It's called Let's Chat About Your Body and Privacy. Mm -hmm. And what happens is it's a very interactive book. It pauses, it asks questions, and you have a discussion. It's designed for a parent or a carer or even the teacher to go go through this with their child. And it goes through the different stages, and it goes through the two characters. It goes through their journeys of different situations that they go through, and they ask what they should do, what they shouldn't do. And in a child-friendly, in a relatable way, it actually raises the topic of body privacy. Um, it raises the topic of pornography. And it raises the topic of sexting, the, the, the sharing of sexual images uh, online mm-hmm. or via smartphones and so on. And sometimes parents might find it difficult how to address this. So it's actually done, designed specifically for that. So you're able to do it in such a natural and easy way and actually raise this topic and discuss it with them. Okay. So... Um, just to interject that, I can actually back that up. Um, I was speaking to a fellow um, therapist just just this week around the rise of the influx of um, pornography coming through you know, in couples work that we're doing. So it's absolutely vital that we address it at, at a younger age because it's really having wreaking havoc in our communities and it's something that we don't talk about because we're either embarrassed or we think that's not you know it's not with us, but it does mm. happen and I, I mean it shocked me to say you know, that these, it's coming through PlayStation and things. I wasn't even aware of that. Um, yeah. I, I, how young that, that must be happening. I mean, I'm dealing with adults around this. So, subhanAllah, it is something that we really need to be aware of. Definitely is. And so, as I said, with, with the um, putting the boundaries becomes very important. So, discussing about these harms um, 
and uh, kind of making them aware of it. So you're kind of empowering and upskilling them. Yeah. Then it also becomes about having some limits. So knowing that how are they using a smartphone, how are they using it and the devices. <clears throat> so, for example, if they're coming home, okay, the lockdown has changed things a lot and holidays made you, but if there's a school day, you can have rules that when you come home, you turn in your device. You don't need to use a device, for example, at home. Um, so you can do it in that way. And then, uh, so then you always have the phone, it's, it's, it's given in. If you feel like, no, you still want to give them some time, okay, fine, you can put a time in and put a limit in and say, okay, fine, you can use it between this time and that time, but then you have to hand your phone in. The most important thing and the more dangerous that happen is when we allow our children to have the freedom alone. Mm. So that means that in their bedrooms, it should be a tech-free zone. And if we can maintain that, that's the best thing. Unfortunately, because we have laptops and things that are more mobile around, they go into the rooms. So it should be the case that anybody using any device should be using the central point in the house, the living room, you know, and it should be there. That way it's always in the view of somebody else and there's less chance of them being sneaky and doing something and never should it go into the rooms, you know. So, you know, even look, I know I, I, have, a, I, have, a, I have a small house and, um, you know, I've got overcrowded with children. But we ensure, it doesn't matter how much it is that, no, children will always have access to either the laptops or anything will be in the central point in the house. Mm -hmm. So whenever there's a laptop, it's always in the living room and we'll make space. It doesn't matter how difficult it may be, we'll do that because the longer interest is the interest of my child and their protection. The moment you allow it into the room, so allowing the console to go into the room, allowing a laptop to go into the land, the phone going, this is where the problems start. Mm -hmm. And this is where the breakdown in the family also happens. Because then what ends up happening is the child is locked away in the room. They're no longer part of the house. The living room should be the, the home. Mm. The bedroom should be just for sleeping. I'm going to create that kind of in, in environment. Mm. Um, so kind of having those rules in place. And basic main thing is creating some structure and not allowing un, free, unfettered time and access to basically um, whatever they can do. So there should be a note that, okay, you're allowed to use X, Y, and Z apps. These ones you're not allowed to. Yeah, and the explanation is to also happen the reason why if it's with values or not values. Yeah, thereafter, what needs to then happen is it needs to be using the central point of the house, they shouldn't keep it in the room and they shouldn't use it overnight. Obviously, the next one is if they're allowed in the room, then it's about letting them all night be using it and the harms and impacts that it has for them on there. So, there are many stages you can keep on pushing back to. Mm. If I was to go back to the origin of it all, I would say don't give them a smartphone until they're old enough, mm. don't give them a uh, don't give basically don't even give them a phone unless you have to if you do then give a dumb phone if you then then have to give them a smartphone then you need to be restrictive on the access of the apps and so on and so on because at the end of the day you have to realize your children cannot make the right choices yeah. they're too young and it's, it's like i said it's just like giving them drugs and say don't have it then mm. it's in front of them they're gonna they're gonna test it out they're gonna try it because that's what everybody else is doing and they're seeing now the difficulty you have is children will always say oh but my friend's doing this and my friend's doing that so then that's why it's important you have continued dialogue with your child. You actually talk with them, mm. understand their feelings, understand their emotions, connect with them. But then once you connect with them and you understand and they feel like you've understood them. Mm. So this also comes with the issue of listening, that we should listen to understand them. A lot of the times we listen to reply, to refute, mm. to object to whatever it may be. So the moment the first word comes out of your mouth, I've already formed an answer ready to hit back at you. Mm. That shouldn't be the case. Rather, it should be that we've, uh, that we actually listen and understand, put ourselves in their shoes, resonate with their feelings. And then they will be like, okay, mom understands me, dad's understanding me. Then you can go into the next stage of the conversation and say, look, well, we've got a problem here. Problem is, these are our values, this is what we have. But then you've got an issue, this is it. So how do we come to a middle ground? How do we come to something where you win and I win? And we come to that and you work with them. And the more you can have that mutually acceptable uh, kind of plan in place or rules in place, the more easy it is to maintain and to uphold. Mm -hmm. The moment you come as an external force and just say, no, this is only being allowed, then the problem comes in. So while I've had the discussion about with my children several times, it's mutually agreeable, understandable that this is what's happening. At the same time, they also know the age and when it's going to happen. It can't be, you're never going to get it. Yeah. You also need to know. And then by that time comes, inshallah, they've, they've learned through the process and they're a bit more ready. And then when they do have it, it doesn't mean again, same thing. You just allow them to have everything, phase it and step by step. Mm. So then they're ready and they're mature enough to make the right decisions. Thank you. That was like a very thorough explanation. I think, you know, just explaining like each step, um, 
and having the courage as, as listening to a parent to say, actually, I can hold on till 16 um, because I know all of my daughter's friends have a smartphone, except my daughter. I've allowed her on a group on my phone to go in once a week and talk to her friends. And I said they can come and visit and things, but she's not having the phone free hand. But it's very difficult for parents because everybody else has got it and there's that peer pressure. And you're right, if we connect back to values, being okay with discomfort, having conversations where, you know, I'm sad, I want this, and the parent is an ally to the child and not somebody who's saying, well, no, you can't, I'm in opposition to you. No, I'm with you. I know it's hard. I know it's difficult. But what's the bigger goal here? Why are we doing this? And, and that's what we are as Muslims, ultimately, we're doing it for the sake of Allah and we want to enter Jannah and we're going to, throughout our lives, have things that we want to do, but we won't be able to do because we love Allah, we choose not to do that thing. And so we're teaching that at this very young age. I just want to first of all say thank you for the extra time. Um, I've, I've personally have benefited immensely i've made loads of notes <laughs> i kept looking yeah. down so what i would love is um if you could send me some information around the books um your websites your page if i could just share that with everybody because i know people will want to know and I, i've already started getting messages in the inbox um i'd love to refer people back to you so that they can get more access to some of the things and the resources sure. that you reference to um jazakallah khayran so much for your time yeah. um your effort um if anybody has any questions i'll just hold on for about 30 seconds um ah so they're just saying please save the live it was amazing so i will i've saved the other one and i'll put this as part two and it'll also go up on my youtube inshallah so you can benefit from okay, them then thank you so much <laughs>